Every small town in the United States has its own special character. It is unique, quite unlike any other place in the world. But in a larger sense, each small town can be taken as typical of many other small focal points of population in America. There is the same easy pace, the same unity of culture, tradition, background, a cohesiveness of society. Many of the citizens of the town are shopkeepers, for this is the chief shopping center for the surrounding farm country. There is a cohesiveness of government, too, for the democratic essence of representative government is most clearly apparent in a small town. A large segment of the population earns its living by fishing, primarily for shrimp. The good transportation facilities have attracted several industries to the town. A new plant has been erected recently, a welcome addition to the community because it provides additional employment. The educational facilities of a region form a significant guide to its culture. The schools in this community are well equipped and well staffed. high school serves not only the town, but the children from the neighboring farm regions as well. These then are some of the physical components of the town. But here in the high school, we may find some other elements, less tangible ones perhaps, but nonetheless essential to an understanding of the town. For in the education of the young, the pattern of a culture can be clearly seen. What students in a social science class learn about the philosophy of government, for example, can tell us a great deal about a people. They have already learned that the history of civilization is the history of social change. Now, they will discuss the methods that different cultures have used to solve the problems created by social change. The instructor is prepared to illustrate graphically the two solutions to such problems that have been devised. He says, the first method consists of a government structure, something like a pyramid. In such a government, all important decisions are made by one person or a small group of persons at the top. These decisions are imposed on the masses of the people. Such a structure serves no useful purpose for the people supporting it. The pyramid type of government exists only to bring power, prestige, and material benefits to the ruler. The people have no rights or privileges as citizens. There is no legal avenue to change old or enact new laws. The government in power is a law unto itself. Any attempts by the people to make changes are crushed by the government. Its officials cannot be influenced by public opinion. The very expression of adverse opinions is considered a crime. This is how such governments meet the challenge of social change, by suppression. Minor social changes are permitted only to strengthen the government's hold on the people. Significant changes are possible only by overthrowing the government structure itself. Another method for solving problems growing out of social change 
is a form of government we call democracy, a kind of house designed to shelter and protect the citizens. These houses of democracy have many different facades, but each provides the people with services not otherwise available. Each has a workshop available to all citizens in which significant changes in the structure can be made, changes designed to satisfy the growing needs of the people. Whenever the majority of the citizens decides to change their building, they do so by using the workshop to construct the needed improvements. Such changes, such needed improvements, are constantly being made in a progressive, growing democracy. But the citizens never change the basic foundation on which their house is built. Every democracy is based on a fixed body of law, like the foundation of a house. This body of law guarantees freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, and provides, in voting, a method whereby the people, through their representatives, can make the democratic structure serve their needs. The actual business of government, the operating of the workshop, is usually done by officials selected in free elections by the majority of the citizens. And so we see that the entire world is populated by groups of people, some living in slavery, oppressed by the pyramid of tyranny, others living in freedom, in a democratic house they have built themselves. When the teacher has finished his chalk talk, the students have many questions to ask. Having grown up under the democratic structure, these students are eager to learn more about the unfamiliar system, the pyramid system, as their instructor calls it, when the question is raised as to what is wrong with the pyramid system, the instructor points out that while such a system can be effective in achieving its aims, it does so at a tremendous cost. He shows them a film to illustrate this cost, a film on Nazi Germany. Germany, 1920, a nation on the verge of chaos, strangled by inflation, paralyzed by widespread unemployment. The nation was in desperate need. A tradition of democratic government was new in Germany, and the people did not understand how to use the democratic structure to solve their urgent problems. Instead, they listened eagerly, uncritically, to every demagogue who offered a quick solution to the problems of the nation. One man, intent on grasping dictatorial power, deluded the people and bullied his way into office. So it was that Hitler came to power and began his march to dictatorship. In the beginning, Hitler's regime seemed to operate within the framework of the democratic structure. By means of rigorous economic controls enacted by edict, the economy was superficially stabilized. There was full employment for the first time in years. The nation seemed prosperous. But behind the facade of prosperity, there was terror. Those who opposed the Nazis' march to dictatorship were forcibly arrested without even the semblance of a legal trial.
Others were thrown into concentration camps by the millions to be slaughtered in mass killings, to die by the slower death of torture, starvation, exposure. This reign of terror was the natural accompaniment of the Nazi dictatorship. For only by rigorous oppression of his opponents can a dictator ensure stability of his rule. But there was misery in Nazi Germany, even for those who tacitly supported the regime. There was a maximum production of food, but not for civilians and women. Industry flourished, but there were no clothes, no fuel, no goods for the people. Everything the country produced went to the army. Food, textiles, machinery, houses, guns. Nazi Germany was a totalitarian state, organized for total war. There was room for nothing else but war. With the war, with all wars, comes destruction, starvation, disease. These are the fruits of dictatorship. When the leaders of a nation are not responsible to the people, the people suffer. When the people suffer, the nation suffers. When a government holds the welfare of the state superior to the welfare of the people, the people become nothing. The nation crumbles and disintegrates to lie dormant until the people gather strength to follow back the difficult path to recovery and democracy. Yes, the film was a shock, but the instructor thinks it has answered the question of what is wrong with a pyramid kind of government. Ancient Egypt and Nazi Germany were both able to solve the problems of social change. The students understand now at what a cost such a solution is made. But what about the democratic system? How do such systems solve the problems growing out of social change? Democracy is a dynamic thing, ever sensitive to the needs and pressures of the people, even in such a small community as this one. Every day, new things happen in a town. Organic changes, creating problems which must be solved by democratic action. The new manufacturing plant, which was built two years ago, was such a change. The problem it created was a simple one, something no one thought of. As part of the plant's operation, a waste material was being discharged into the bay a foreign substance pouring into the water for two years. A simple thing. No one had noticed it. But something has been happening in the nearby waters where most of the local shrimp fishermen work. It seems hard to believe that such a large body of water as the bay could be affected by a small stream of waste material. And yet, Something was happening to the shrimp. Every time the nets were brought up, there were fewer and fewer shrimp. The small, worthless, inedible fish that were always found in the nets did not seem to be affected, but the shrimp were being driven away, forced to migrate to new waters, cleaner waters. It hardly seemed worthwhile to throw the nets anymore, the shrimp catch was so small. It all happened so gradually that it took a considerable time before the fishermen realized what had happened. After a while, the catches were so bad, there were so few shrimp that they didn't even bother to sort out the catch. Throw everything back to the sea. 
There is nothing here that can be used, nothing that can be marketed. Throw it all back and head for home. Some of the fishermen are resigned. They say that the shrimp will come back someday, and meanwhile, there'll be bad times for everyone. Too bad if some men have to sell their boats. Nothing can be done. But there are some other fishermen who think something can be done. They know that something has happened to drive the shrimp away. Perhaps if they hire experts, scientists to investigate, the cause of the disaster would come to light and the shrimp could be brought back. They decide to raise the money to pay for such an investigation. The investigators hired by the fishermen get to work. They analyze the water of the bay, and they test the waters that flow into the bay from every source, natural or man-made. Finally, they arrive at the waste disposal outlet of the new manufacturing company. They are looking for a substance that has been destroying the microscopic organisms on which the shrimp feed. The shrimp have disappeared because their food supply has been destroyed. The tests show that the polluting material comes from the plant. The mystery has been solved. With the evidence at hand, the investigators return immediately to their clients, the fishermen. The fishermen gather together quickly to hear the news. Their whole livelihood is at stake and they're anxious to find out if something can be done. The investigators explain that the waste material discharged by the new plant has been destroying the food of the shrimp, and the shrimp, in turn, have simply moved on to better feeding grounds. The fishermen decide to send a delegation to the plant manager. The entire fishing industry is threatened by the plant's waste discharge, and the fishermen want prompt action. If something is done quickly, if the destructive chemicals of the plant are kept out of the bay, the shrimp may come back. But the scientists have pointed out that the shrimp will be lost to the bay forever if the necessary action is not taken at once. Knowing this, the fishermen's delegation is determined to make its mission a success. After they reach the plant manager's office and introduce themselves, they explain what has happened, how the shrimp on which the fisherman's living depends have left the bay, and how the investigators have proven that the plant's waste discharge is responsible for this disaster. The manager tells them the operation of the plant requires the disposal of large quantities of the waste material and that there is no way to get rid of it except in the bay. The fishermen think the manager does not understand. How can he talk of plant operation when they have no money to bring home?
The manager is patient. He explains once more, and he points out that the employees of the plant would suffer too if the plant were to shut down, as it must, if they cannot dispose of the waste. No, the plant will do nothing, and there is no law that says they cannot do as they please in the matter. The fishermen are angry. They are not concerned about the plant's employees. Their own imminent tragedy is the urgent matter. What happened? Now, what'd they say? It's no good, no good. It's no good, they won't do anything. They don't care anything about what happened to us. Let's show them. They are angry men, desperate men. Who do they think they are anyway? Man, break the blade! These are a simple people. Violence seems to be their only solution. Come on, let's go! Yeah, let's get going! Who do they think the last went on a port, do they? They can't get away with that stuff! Come on, let's go! can't go around hurting people that way, getting mad and beating somebody up. Why not? Because this is a democracy, and we got different ways to do things here. A young fisherman, a veteran of the war, has a different idea. He reminds the men of their fathers and grandfathers who came to the United States looking for freedom and equality by law. By law. That's the important thing, he says. We got laws to settle this kind of thing, not fighting. We had enough fighting in the war. The second fisherman gets the idea. That's right. We got a constitution here. We got laws and judges to protect our rights. He talks about the constitution, the legal machinery created by their forefathers to put right such unfair hardships as now beset them. In some countries, he is saying, neither the fishermen nor the plant owners would have anything to say about it. The authorities would just have one side or the other thrown into a concentration camp or even shot. But it doesn't happen that way here in the United States. They remember now. Their panic, their anger made them forget their rights and duties as citizens of a democracy. But they remember now. The two eloquent speakers are appointed to present on their behalf a formal complaint to the town's governing body the Board of Selectmen. This board, which has its offices in the City Hall, has in this community three members, freely elected by the citizens of the township. When the two young fishermen make their complaint, when they tell the story of what happened to the shrimp, a well-established function of government will be put into motion. Board of Selectmen makes a thorough, painstaking investigation. They question the fishermen and get statistics on the decrease of the shrimp. They see the waste material and arrange for a community survey of waste disposal. They listen to the story of the plant manager, all aimed at finding out if the grievance is a true one, and if it is, how it can be rectified. Finally, the Board of Selectmen is ready to act. This is the day of the final hearing at which the decision of the Board will be announced. The high school class in social studies comes to the meeting too. Now, the teacher can show the class how the democratic process solves a problem growing out of social change in their own community. The chief officials of the plant have come, as well as all the fishermen. The Board of Selectmen has prepared carefully for this meeting. They know the citizens of the community expect them to provide a solution for the problem that will work a hardship on no one, a solution that will be practical, effective, and just. The chairman of the board begins by describing what he and his fellow Selectmen have discovered in the course of their investigations. 
they have found that the problem of water pollution is a serious one, threatening not only the livelihood of the fishermen, but the health of the community as well. Furthermore, with the town expanding as it is, the problem of sewage disposal will undoubtedly increase in complexity as time goes on. The chairman next introduces a county public health officer who explains that waste products of practically every kind, including those that already exist in the community and those that may develop in future years, are in some way destructive or potentially dangerous. Every progressive community, he goes on to say, must recognize that sewage disposal is a community problem, not an individual one. The chairman introduces one of his fellow select men who has made a detailed study of the existing body of local law. In reporting on his findings, this select man states that there is no statute in the local law making it illegal to pollute public waters. In fact, there is no statute whatsoever dealing with the problem of sewage disposal. To correct this situation, the board proposes that two things be done. First, a section will be added to the health code of the township requiring that every new residence or business establishment have its method of waste disposal inspected and approved. Second, the board proposes that the township build a public sewage disposal plant, similar to this one recently constructed by a neighboring community. The cost of the project to be defrayed by tax assessments on private homes and industrial enterprises proportional to their use. The citizens are favorably impressed, but there are many questions to be answered. As the additional points are clarified, it becomes clear that the board has done its job well. What began as a dispute between two small groups in the community has grown into a recognition of a basic evil menacing the entire community. The problem has been solved by the prompt and competent action of the democratically elected representatives of the people. A concrete example of how people solve their problems growing out of social change in a democracy has been witnessed by the high school class and the significance of the events they have just witnessed is pointed out to them by their instructor. Thus we see the chief difference between welfare service in a democracy and in a totalitarian state. Here the service provided, this new sewage disposal plant that we will have for example, grows out of the people's need, all the people. In a dictatorship this might have turned into a trial, with either the fishermen or the plant being penalized. But in a democracy, all the people must be considered. With the tradition of democratic government, based on law, based on a well-defined structure of how to do things for the good of the majority of the people, the nation can flourish, the community can flourish, because the people flourish.